Hello, we're looking here at a longitudinally sectioned long bone, and this is the bony cortex, and this is the marrow. Let me just turn this around so that we can appreciate uh, the all the angles. So here again, we're looking at the cortex, which is more or less intact, and coming back round to the cut surface. The main pathology actually lies in the bone marrow, and we can see that this cut surface appears to be somewhat uh, mottled looking. And let's take a closer look. So as I bring the magnifier downwards, we can see that there are some of these areas and some cavity formation within the bone marrow, and also these friable or very brittle appearing bits that almost appear to be falling off. Here again, we can see some cavity formation and in this region, there is a cavity. There is this uh, tan pale area here, which likely represents necrotic bone. And this is surrounded by an area of viable bone. So the diagnosis here is osteomyelitis, which is inflammation of the bone and bone marrow. And this is almost always secondary to infection. Let's look at another example. In this specimen, we are looking at the mandible and we're looking downwards from the top. So these are the tops of the teeth, the molars and the incisors. And this is the area of abnormality. Again, let me just move this around. So we're looking at the bony cortex here. This is from the bottom view looking upwards. I'm going to focus on this area. So let's magnify this region and we can see that uh, the cortex has been opened and we're looking inside in the marrow space there is again an area of cavitation and there is this brownish friable appearing material so this likely represents some bleeding and some granulation tissue and we can see that there is no intact viable bone marrow in this region moving over to this area the mucosa over the gums is intact and we can see that the teeth are still intact and attached here. So this also represents osteomyelitis. Let's take a quick look at the pathology of osteomyelitis. It is defined as inflammation of the bone and marrow and this is almost always due to infection. Uh, it can start off as a solitary focus of direct infection in the bone itself or it can arise as part of systemic infection. And uh, there are many different types of organisms that can give rise to osteomyelitis. Uh, particularly, bacterial infections are quite common. And pyogenic osteomyelitis is one such example. There can be direct inoculation of the bacterial organisms, for example, in open fractures, perhaps from road traffic accidents, etc., in patients with diabetes, and also in the setting of hematogenous spread of infection where there are bacterial organisms in the bloodstream. Mycobacterial osteomyelitis can also occur, and this is usually quite difficult to treat. Other organisms, ranging from fungal to parasites to even viral organisms, can also give rise to osteomyelitis. Clinically, the patients may present with systemic symptoms like fever, malaise, chills, and they often have this throbbing pain over the area of the infected bone. There may even be soft tissue abscesses. So if the infection from the bone actually breaks through the periosteum that overlies the bone, this can involve the surrounding soft tissue. And in fact, it can go all the way into the skin. So this can give rise to infected sinus tracts leading uh, from the bone all the way to the skin. In terms of the x-rays, often there is a lytic area, which is the dead bone, and this is surrounded by a sclerotic appearing rim. It is particularly important to pick up and treat osteomyelitis, especially in infants and young children, because one of the complications is that the infection can move on to involve the joint, giving rise to septic arthritis, and can also destroy the growth plate, which is essential for normal lengthening and growth of the bone. So this can give rise to permanent disability. And some of the complications if uh, osteomyelitis uh, persists is that there can be many acute exacerbations even years after the initial event and this also obviously will weaken the bone so this can give rise to pathologic fracture as well. Grossly, there is often a necrotic center known as the sequestrum as you can see here this reddish area 
and there is a surrounding shell of reactive bone, which is viable or living bone. So this gives rise to this very mottled appearance with some um, areas suggestive of cavitation, some friable, brittle appearing dead bone and surrounding viable bone. This is just uh, an example of relatively normal bone marrow to compare with the abnormal bone. In children, there may be subperiosteal abscesses. This can actually track longitudinally along the bone and it can also break through to the soft tissue and then subsequently to the skin, giving rise to sinuses. Microscopically, usually we see bony necrosis. So here is uh, the trabeculae of the bone and um, within these empty spaces, Normally, we would see osteocyte nuclei, but these are empty and devoid of nuclei. So this is what necrotic bone looks like. Within the marrow space, we can see a range of inflammatory cells depending on the time course of the disease. So early in the disease, we may see more neutrophils. And there are a couple of neutrophils seen here with the multi-lobed nuclei. And in the more chronic phase, we can also see plasma cells, lymphocytes. And um, sometimes there is a zone of viable bone around the necrotic bone. So in summary, we have here a case of osteomyelitis and a long bone. And looking at the marrow space, we can see that there are areas of very friable appearing tissue and dead bone surrounded by areas of viable or live bone. And some of the complications would include uh, tracking of the infection along the subperiosteal region and also breaking out into the adjacent soft tissue and even to the skin. Thank you.